Now, most of you, I know, some of you might have rather been mushroom hunting this morning. Or it's such a nice day, maybe you wanted to do some yard work or whatever, but I believe the Lord has a word for you today. That word is powerful, it's important, it's, it's applicable for our lives, and it all centers around Jesus being alive. Not dead, not partially alive, but fully alive. If you would take just a moment in your bulletin, there's a stewardship pledge card. I just want to take a moment with that this morning before I begin. Stewardship Sunday is the 18th. We would ask you to prayerfully consider these things. We would ask you to fill out that card, sign that card, turn that card in as a pledge, not just to the church, but as to the Lord, based upon what the Lord has been doing in your life. What has the Lord been doing in your life? And so stewardship is really uh, far more than just money. Stewardship is about my life, my time, my energy, my resources. Stewardship is about me and what am I willing to pledge or give to the Lord in the coming year for His kingdom work. And so there's four levels there that we would ask you to prayerfully consider. We would ask you to pray, uh, seek the Lord about that, fill out the card as, as the Lord Uh, prompts you, sign that card, bring it back to the church on the 18th. If you know you're not going to be here on the 18th, we would really appreciate it if you would somehow get it to us before the 18th so that we can kind of take account of those things. Um, So stick this in your Bible, uh, be praying for that. Again, I want to reiterate what I shared last week. I'm grateful, the church is grateful for those of you who have... um, heard our heart, heard the need, and responded to that need. I pray that all of us will somehow be able to be involved in not just the ministry part of what we do here at Cornerstone, but every part. Uh, the, the numbers are astounding. A recent survey basically helps us understand that Really, less than 1% of American Christians actually tithe. And so Malachi 3 actually comes to fruition for us because the Lord says, Bring into my house, storehouse, your tithe, and I will pour out so much blessing that you don't, that you will not have room enough for of it, but if you don't, there will be a curse on you. Well, I would submit to you that we in America may be living under that curse. And I want you, it's really important to note that that curse is not a demonic curse. That is a curse that is brought upon you by God. God is bringing that on you. And so it's something to pray about. Something to seek the Lord about. It's every man's heart must be where it needs to be. And so uh, pray, seek the Lord, respond to that as the Lord would lead. Our heart is not to twist your arm or try to make you feel, but we want you to know the word. Today, why does God love me? After being in ministry for nearly 25 years at different levels and different places, one of the things Mary and I have probably experienced more than, than we really ever thought was the understanding that most people, even people who are Christians, don't really know God's love. They don't really understand God's love for them. Why does God love me? And in a world where we are clumped together and we are gathered together, Really, God's love for me is a very individual thing. Why does God love me? Well, first of all, we must get a hold of what does God's love look like. Psalms 136 says, His love endures forever. 
It's a great chapter in the Bible. Pull out your Bible, read Psalms 136. If you want to know how much God loves you, read Psalms 136. It goes through a whole list of things of the nation of Israel and how all the, every time that they turned away from God, God still says His love endures for them forever. And so God's love for us is forever. John 3 says, For God so loved the world. He loved the world and so He gave Jesus. There's a stewardship sermon right there if you want to talk about it. But God so loved the world, He was so in love with us and uh, each one of us, uh, us as man, that he, he gave. John 15 says, Jesus said, remain in my love. In other words, there's this place for us as disciples of simply remaining in the love of Christ. Remaining in that place of that love relationship. Revelation chapter 3 Chapter 2 or 3, forgive me, the, the church of Ephesus got, Jesus reprimanded the church because they had given up their first love. They were no longer loving Christ. They weren't remaining in that love relationship with Christ. And so love is remaining. John 15 says, greater love has no man than this, than he would lay down his life for his friends. And so we know that that's what Jesus did. He loved us and laid down his life. Ephesians 2 says, but because of his great love for us. So if if you can agree with me this morning that God loves us, just start nodding your head. God loves you. God has a love for you. That is like no other love you will ever experience. Why does he love me? What does his love look like? Well, Paul writes to the church in Corinth in, in 1 Corinthians 13, and he, and he, and he commands the church to, to do this. He says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud... It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. Well, if God is commanding us to love each other like that, then does it make sense that that is how God is going to love us? That basically, Paul writes for us a clear image of what God's love is for us, what it looks like for us. That it is never fails. It is always present for me. It is patient. It is kind. It is not envious. It is not boastful. It is not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It does not keep a record of my wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Those are big words. Always are big words. Always. So God's love for me is eternal. God's love for me never fails. God's love for me never walks away. In fact, I'll submit to you that more times than not, those people, those of us who struggle with understanding God's love is very rarely about God's love for us, but it's, it's very rarely about Him turning away from us, but it's always about us turning away from Him. We're the ones who leave the course. We're the ones who change direction. We're the ones who turn our back. He never does. We're the ones who decide to change the relationship. Not him. Now many people would argue with you, well, how come, how come bad things happen to good people? Anybody notice the, the, the recent Christian song out there where the guy's saying he looks around the world and, and, and 
He sees all these terrible things and he says, God, why is that like that? And God's why is this like this? And why don't you fix this? And why don't you do that? That's the, that's the struggle for us as Christians, isn't it? How often do we throw those things at the doorstep of God when it's not God at all? I will tell you a whole lot. Most of the times we throw all of those negative things at God's doorstep saying, well, God, you should do this and God, you should do that. And God didn't have anything to do with it. Sin did. People did. That's who had everything to do with it. People who turned away from God are the problem there, not God. Well, what about those people who call themselves Christians and still do that? I'll let you answer that one for yourself. See, the challenge for us is to recognize that God's love for me is always ready. It's always there. Even in difficult, hard, challenging situations. God is always just waiting for me to turn to him. To let him love me in that. So today I want to paint a picture for you. Why does God love me? Why does God love me? First point this morning, because... Because I am his creation. If you are a believer in evolution, you are not going to like this segment of this sermon. You did not come from a mud puddle. You are not a polywog that suddenly walked out of a mud puddle and suddenly crawled itself up on the bank and suddenly started walking and suddenly started looking like a caveman and suddenly started looking like an ape and suddenly started looking like this and suddenly started looking... You are not that person. I don't care what science says. I don't care what teachers say. I don't care what the university says. You are not that person. You are created by God. Period. You are his creation. For you were created in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's room. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are his creation. I am always amazed at what happens to a couple who has their first child. And how immediately they are different. The split second that that first child comes into the world, something happens to them. Tiredness. That too. Somebody say amen. But the thing that really happens to them is suddenly they have gone through the creation process. And from them has come a new life. Every time when we were born... That's exactly how God viewed us. Like the parent standing there with his hands open.
look at what happened. He sees us as his creation, as his child, as his infant. He does not see us with all of our problems and all of our stuff. He simply sees us as his creation. I'm amazed at the diversity of his creation. How no two people are alike. Whenever a child is born, you will invariably enter into this conversation, well, especially at the family level. Well, he looks like mom. He looks like dad. He looks like mom. And it's always the mom's parents who think they look like mom and the dad's parents who think. Have you noticed that? But the reality is they simply look like them. And they are uniquely created. There will never be another one of them, ever. That shows us how much He loves us. He makes us so unique. He broke the mold after we were born. There will never be another one like me, or like you, or like any of us. So he loves me because I am his creation. He knew me in my mother's womb. He knit me together in my mother's womb. He gave me my giftings, my personality. He he put all of that in me. He created me. Because I am his creation. Secondly, because I am his child. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. 1st we are His creation. Secondly, when Christ comes into our life, we become His children. And like a good parent, He becomes our Father. Like many of our children... We like to rebel against our Father. We want to go our way. And the Father is still and always will be the Father. And His love for me never changes. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of the prodigal son because I love the image of the Father. The father in the story of the prodigal son knows his son is absolutely messing up, but his love for his son never changed. He never stopped loving his son, but he did allow his son to suffer the consequences of his choices. See, that's a father. That's a father. See, because I am his child, he's going to look at me in a father-child relationship. Now, here's the hard thing for us as adults. We never stop being his child, no matter how old we get. We never stop being his child, no matter how old we get. Or how long we happen to live on this earth. He always sees us as his child. Just like my dad, even though I'm 53 years old and a man of my own, still sees me as his son. Just like you, no matter how old your kids will be, will still see them as your child. And at times, our parents actually treat us as children. 
because maybe that's what we need. Because maybe that's how we're acting. And God will treat us as children when we act like children. So he loves me because I am his child. I am his creation and I am his child. Lastly, he loves me because I am his most prized possession. I am absolutely his most prized possession. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You are His most prized possession. Now, the idea of possession there makes us a little bit uncomfortable. I don't want to be somebody's possession. You are. Whether you want to be or not, you are. That's really hard for us in the Western culture because... We are so ingrained with this idea that we are our own and ourself and we stand on our own two feet and we do all these things. And to be quite honest with you, we don't do diddly squat. He does everything. We are so prized, we are so important to Him that even Peter tells us in Scripture that He is slow in coming because He is desiring everyone, all of His creation, all of His children to come into right and true relationship with Him as Father. So He is slow. He is delaying the end giving all of us even more opportunities to come to Him. That's how much He loves us. He's willing to delay for me. He's willing to delay for your neighbors, for your family members. He's willing to delay. At some point, He's going to not be willing to delay. I don't know when that point is. Nobody knows when that point is. Even Jesus doesn't know when that point is. Only Father God knows when that point is. But until that time, he is willing to delay so that his prized possessions will come into right and true relationship with him as Father through Jesus. We are so prized that he gave his son, Jesus. So that we can be gained back into or re-enter into a right relationship with the Father. We are His most prized possession. We are more important to Him than creation. We are more important to Him than money. We are more important to Him than anything. Than His angels. We are more important to Him than anything. And each one of us are equally valued. No one person is valued over another. All people are equally valued and equally loved by God. Because we are his prized possession. Because he gave everything for us. I've worked with several people in counseling kind of situations. And oftentimes this is a statement that will help people really understand what I'm trying to say to you in this part right here. And here's the thing. If you were the only person on earth, Jesus would have still died for you. If you had been the only person ever created, Jesus would have still died for you.
That's how important we are to him. That's how important your neighbor is to him. That's how important your family member is to him. That he's willing to delay the eternal outcome. Giving all of us more and more and more and more chances to come to full repentance. That's a lot of love. In fact, that's more love than I deserve. I don't deserve that much love. I don't deserve to be loved that much. But that's how much He loves me. That's how much He loves every person. He loves me because I am His creation, because I am His child, because I am His most prized possession. That's why God loves me. It's not something that I can earn. It's not something that I can gain. It's something that I already have. In fact, I've had it for all eternity. Because even before I was born, He knew me. Before I was conceived, He knew me. Before I ever breathed a breath, He knew me. He knew the number of hairs on my head. He knew the number of days I would exist. He knew the job I would have, the family I would have, the wife I would have. He knew everything there was ever to know about me before anything ever existed. That's how much He loves me. In a world and a culture today where we have to earn our way, we must know that we will never, ever, 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 ever do anything that will earn my love from God. It is given to me freely. Just like when that first child was born, it was just there. That's how much he loves me. And so for that becomes a point of freedom for me because now I don't have to try to earn his love. I just get to live in his love. I just get to have his love. But I have to accept it. I have to believe it. I have to be willing to open myself up to it. And here's a big one. I have to stop blaming God for every bad thing that's ever happened to me. See, I know what that feels like because I lived like that for 33 years. Blaming God for something that God didn't have anything to do with. We have to stop blaming God. God is far bigger than that. If you want to blame something, then blame sin. Blame sin. Don't blame God. Don't blame God. Why does God love me? 
today, maybe you need to really get a hold of this idea that He loves me. He absolutely loves me. He absolutely loves me no matter what I've done. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. No matter what I've been through, He loves me. No matter what stupid mistake I have made or stupid words I have used, or dumb choices that I have, I have done. He still loves me. No matter whether there has been disease or hurt or pain or accidents or terrible things that happen to so many people, He still loves me. His love for me has never changed. No matter how terrible my parents were, or my boss is, or any of that stuff, God still loves me. And in that becomes my resting place. It's like I'm crawling into the arms of my father, and I'm just experiencing his love. I had an interesting experience this past week. My wife was out of town for four days. So Grandpa decided that he was going to have party nights at his house. So because Grandpa knows he is not strong enough to handle all three of them at the same time, we did it three nights in a row. So I had... Abram, Monday night, and I had little Marty, Tuesday night, and I had Lola, Wednesday night, and they spent the night with me. It was interesting. <laughs> it was interesting because I learned a lot about my grandkids. I learned what they thought of me, number one. In lots of different ways. I learned how they responded to me, number two. And I learned not to sleep in the same bed with Abram. <laughs> not that Abram's a bad boy, but he is all over the bed. Somebody say amen. <laughs> but it was interesting because, you know, as, as grandpa, I'm, I'm not dad, so I'm grandpa. And it was, it was powerful for me to have this, that individual time with them and just spend that time with them and, you know, brushing the teeth and the mouthwash and getting the pajamas on and, you know, what each one of them wanted to do. Lola wanted to talk the whole time. <laughs> From the time she came to my house at 5 o'clock in the afternoon till we went to bed, literally till she fell asleep, which is about 1030, she never stopped talking. She is definitely one of those women who are going to be using 35,000 words a day. <laughs> Never. She didn't stop talking the whole time. The problem for me was I couldn't understand what she was saying about 90% of the time. I was only getting about 10% of the conversation. I was just able to get this word or that word. I mean, she definitely has Lola knees going on. Come on now. But, you know, I just listened. I just tried to listen, and I could pick up here and there, and we were, you know. Marty, he just wanted to curl up on the couch, turn the TV on, watch a basketball game. Grandpa was happy with that one. We was good. We were okay. We had soda. We had popcorn. We had, you know, we just had a great night. Abram, Abram's just Abram. He's a good boy, but he, he, he's got lots of questions. He wants to ask lots of questions. He's got lots of things he wants to try. He's a, he wants to discover things. He likes to discover things. So 
So we're outside, and he's discovering, and we're talking, and he's discovering. And But I couldn't help but just make a connection here. That's how God sees every one of us. He's Grandpa. And if you're a grandparent, you're making a really strong connection right here, right now. If you're just a parent, you're getting it. It's powerful stuff. He just wants us to let him be grandpa or dad. That's what he wants. He wants to listen to us. He wants to hear our hearts. He wants to let us discover and share with us all kinds of things. He wants to just curl up on the couch, cover up in a blanket, and do whatever. That's who he is. Religion has destroyed for us the idea of intimate relationship. The idea of religion has killed the idea of relationship. And we were created as children for relationship. Not for religion. But for relationship with a Father God who just loves me right where I am. Mary and I read a book a few months back and The book is written by Jerry and Denise Basil, and and in this book, um, Jerry and Denise make a statement that just has really sunk into me, and it's so powerful. And the statement is simply this, God will never love you any more than He loves you right now. His love for you will never be greater than what it is right now. In other words, no matter what I may do or be a part of, His love for me is the same now as it will be then. God loves us. He loves us. When you boil everything away, He simply loves us. And He loves every person that we know. And He is patient with us, kind with us, generous with us, tolerating us not holding against us things from the past or the things from the future. He is Grandpa. I invite you to bow your heads this morning. The worship team comes. I really want to invite you to just take this moment and encounter the love of God for your life right here, right now. What is God speaking into your heart right here at this moment? What are you, what's He saying to you? I believe that He would be saying to you that He loves you. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, He loves you. I think He would say to you that no matter what you've been through, no matter how hard it's been, no matter how difficult it's been, I love you, and I was there. I know it wasn't fun. I know it wasn't easy. I know it was hard, but I was there. 
And my love for you has not changed. I love you. I want to help you through that. I think he may be saying to someone here this morning that, that you need to open your heart to my love. I love you so much that I gave my son Jesus for you. And you need to open your heart to that love and let me come and start living inside of you. Let me come and start breaking down those walls that you have around your heart. Let me come and show you how much I really love you. Not in a religious way, but in a true, heartfelt, grandpa, father love. He just wants you to crawl up in his lap let him put his arms around you and let him love on you. The people who have hurt us and wounded us are not God. They are people. People who have sin in their lives. God is perfect. God does not have sin. God cannot make a mistake. God simply loves you. For the invitation day, we're going to do something just a little bit different. And I'm going to invite you, if, you're, if you need to come up here this morning and you have never accepted Jesus as Christ and Lord of your life and you want to open your heart to Jesus here this morning and you want, to, you want to take that thing and you want to open up and you want to let the love of God begin to come into your life and you want to become repentant and you want to serve Jesus and you want to let Him start living in your life, I'm going to invite you to come to this side over here. There's going to be people here who's going to help you with that. But if you're here this morning and you need to experience a fresh touch of the love of God, I invite you to come to this side. If you really want to sense God's love for your life, I invite you to come to this side. Because I believe God has an appointment with us today. He wants to show us how much He loves us. He wants to come into our lives. He wants us to crawl up in His lap, let Him wrap His arms around us, and just rest. And just rest. And just rest. So I'm just going to invite you to start now, to just come. Just come. Now, just come. Don't wait for the music. Let's just begin. Father, I thank you today in Jesus' name that you love us, that you care about us, that you have never stopped loving us, that you have created us, that we are your children, and that we are your most prized possession. We recognize, Lord, that there have been times in our life where we have placed the blame on you for things that have happened in our lives, things that we had no control over, things that we had no a sense of being able to change or have anything to do with. And we have blamed you for things that were not yours to be blamed for, but in fact, sin is the reason those things have happened. And so we're going to choose today to stop blaming you. We're going to stop blaming you for everything, every bad thing that's happened in our life. We're going to rest in the fact that you have created us, that we are your children, and that you are we are your prized possession and like those things, we want you to become our Father here today and set us free from those things. Set us free from that stuff, that stuff that's holding us down. Lord, we want to be free. We want to be free. We ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would lead us and guide us. We ask that you would direct us in all things here today, that your name would be glorified in every possible way. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you simply to come. Just come.